Okay, everybody. We're gonna go ahead and get started with this panel. Uh, like I said, I am super excited to have uh, the members of the Istio Project uh, Technical Oversight Committee here uh, to talk to us about something um, concerning the way that service mesh is perceived and um, answering questions that you, as people who may have adopted Istio, or, who, or if you're thinking about adopting Istio, we're gonna help maybe disambiguate some things and make some things a little bit clearer. Um, to start off, I'm gonna ask everybody to give a little bit of an introduction, just to make sure everybody knows the names and uh, kind of what you do. So go ahead, Lynn, start off. Hi, everyone, my name is Lin Sang. If you were in my talk earlier, I was the one showing generative AI and how easy to run it on Istio Ambient. So I will, I'm a head of open source working in a small company called Solodio. And prior to that, I worked at IBM for a very, very long time. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Louis Ryan. Uh, I'm also working solo with Lin. I'm the CTO. Uh, prior to that, I worked for Google for an infinite amount of time. Hey, I'm John Howard. I'm a senior architect at Solid.io. I also used to work at Google uh, on Istio. Um, yeah. Uh, and I'm Mitch Connors. I'm a principal engineer at Microsoft on AKS. And I also am formerly of Google. So. <laughs> and I'm your host, Steve Harvey. No, just kidding. Uh, my name is Keith. I'm a, a senior engineering lead at Microsoft. And it's my pleasure, again, to be able to uh, kind of lead this conversation with these uh, amazing people on our uh, TOC. So first, I want to ask you folks a question um, that has to do with the title of this presentation. Raise your hand if you know what a trough of disillusionment is. Sadly. Okay, we've got a couple of people um, who understand what that means. And uh, I kind of want to say I'm sorry if you know what that means. Um, but we're going to get into that and we're going to describe exactly what a trough of dis disillusionment, it's going to be a long presentation if I say that a lot of times. <laughs> we're going to talk about what it is and how we can navigate it as a project and how you as, as users or platform engineers or app developers uh, can navigate uh, this trough uh, in your own businesses. So let's first talk about what it is. And to describe what a trough of disillusionment is, uh, I'm, you have to see this, this photo. Um, this graph is, comes from an analyst firm called Gartner, and um, it's called the hype cycle for platform engineering. Uh, so what Gartner does, they help p users, uh, especially large uh, enterprises, make uh, decisions around what sorts of software and processes to implement based on surveying early adopters and users of these technologies. And earlier this year, they put together this hype cycle for platform engineering. And you can see here uh, where you can trace different technologies and processes and things like that throughout uh, throughout the cycle. And so I'm gonna break down briefly what each one of these um, sections of the graph are, sections of the cycle correspond to. So on the far, far left, you can see uh, the innovation trigger. And these are those usually somewhat early stage um, technologies that are potentially uh, breakthroughs. Um, you see lots of proof of concept things, lots of uh, media attention, uh, where people are trying to create something new and, and break through the noise and make uh, large jumps in innovations. Uh, you've got the, the peak of inflated expectations. So anytime you've got hype, um, you have a lot of early publicity and people thinking, oh, wait, that's going to work perfectly for me. I'm going to go adopt it. You see the surge of adoption and of people going and trying it out. However, you also have, with that, a sense of inflated expectations. So people tend to think the technology does more than, it's, uh, than it actually uh, is supposed to. Uh, you have some stories of failures and things like that. We've got the trough of disillusionment, uh, which I'll save for the next slide. Um, that's where service mesh currently is, if you see in that red square. That's where mesh is. Um, and then the slope of enlightenment, as you start seeing more instances of the technology, finding the right fit. And then lastly, you hit the plateau of productivity uh, where mainstream adoption starts to really take off. So what Gartner has done is they put together this report um, describing uh, all these different technologies. And service mesh, as you can see, is here in this really uncomfortable low section of the graph. You don't like to be in the low parts of curves. Um, so what does this trough mean? 
The trough of disillusionment is where, uh, this is a statement straight from Gartner's website, uh, straight from their methodology. It means that interest in the technology is, is waning as experiments and implementations and people trying out the technology in production fails to deliver on some of those uh, inflated expectations. People often are looking for uh, one-size-fits-all solutions. If you've been in technology long enough, you know that those don't usually exist. Uh, and so those technologies can sometimes you know, fall into this trough where people aren't quite as interested. Um, there are people who are investing in the technology, um, companies, projects, et cetera, that are trying to add new things. Those will either shake out as in they'll be successful or they'll fail. Investments in technology typically only happen if the surviving providers of that process or technology uh, improve their product to the satisfaction of early adopters. Again, that's straight from Gartner. So my first question to our panel, um, looking at what Gartner described as the trough of disillusionment, thinking about, you know, oh, is the interest in service mesh waning? I want to first kind of be reflexive. And so, Lynn, can you talk to us a little bit about how did we get here as service mesh, and maybe even specifically Istio? Yeah, so we started uh, the Istio project, I believe, in 2017. And uh, there was huge, huge, huge interest uh, around Istio. I remember Kelsey Hightower, uh, when he was working at Google, he gave like multiple keynotes around Istio um, onto different conferences. And if you know Kelsey, he liked to show live demos. He always drew people's attention, right? So there was a lot of people kicking tires around Istio. Um, when we first launched the Istio within the first one or two years. Uh, the challenge with the Istio project, though, is Istio uh, is, uh, uh, I, I think, one of the Google product manager, uh, Dan Sorelli, described is uh, Istio is always trying to be the Swiss Army knife, right? It's trying to do uh, everything, everything every single user asks for, right? We try to do uh, traffic shifting, traffic control resilience, they would try to do reach authorization policy, uh, JWT token, there was just a uh, hundred things I can name what Istio can do. And uh, as a young baby and child into the software industry, unfortunately, we have bugs and uh, Istio had a lot of bugs and a lot of people got frustrated because uh, they gave the passion to Istio. Thank you for everybody who tried Istio in the past. And uh, some of you have time and resource and invest in Istio and running Istio in, pro in production. Great job. But some of you, we understand you felt Istio was a little bit too complex. and. Uh, you kind of pull back of your investment, right? You look at, you know, what exactly service mesh do? Do I need service mesh? Is there any other service mesh I can use other than Istio? So that's what's really get into Istio into the current state. But, uh, you know, I'm going to let other people to weigh in because that's how I feel. It's really the history of Istio, the hype of the Istio, and the reality of the people trying Istio in the very early stage and hit bugs and uh, you know got very frustrated. Yeah, Louis, I'm thinking about you as one of the you know co-creators of GRPC or around in the early days of Istio. Can you talk to us about what that hype looked like and sort of the early direction of the project trying to deliver on those expectations? I mean. Istio tried to do so much more than gRPC tried to do, right? I mean, and gRPC was trying to do something extremely specific, right? Deliver a consistent interface, polyglot, very narrow focus. Istio's original tagline was connect, secure, observe, and control. Right? If you go out and look at the vendors, right, or the booths around, like, the showcase tomorrow, you'll see, like, connect is one vendor, another one is secure, and another one is control, and another one is observe. Right? And Istio tried to do all of those things. Um, so, you know, it tried to eat a much bigger lunch and, you know, you know, that lack of focus in the beginning, you know, that has a consequence in terms of your ability to deliver a higher quality, right? There's always a, a trade-off, right, between how many features you're trying to ship and how high quality you can ship them, particularly in a compressed timeline, right? And there was a lot of hype, there was a lot of expectation, there was a lot of pressure. Um, you know, maybe it's an important thing to note, by the way, that this 
all service meshes currently live in the trough. It's not just Istio, right? It's a collective thing, um, which you know kind of extends to every network vendor that's selling service mesh-like capabilities. Um, I don't think anybody would say that networking is in the, the trough of despair or <laughs> whatever it's called. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's just you know, for any ambitious technology, right? It, it's going to take a long time to reach a level of maturity and practicality and utility and find product market fit. Um, you know, you can probably build a good simple thing in three years and get it widely adopted in five. You could probably build a good complex thing in five to seven years and get it adopted in 10. Um, you know, if you look at Kubernetes, Kubernetes is a pretty big, pretty complicated thing. Uh, and it, you know, has been around nine years, I think, since 2015. Uh, and, you know, if you look at its penetration into the market, right, it's still less than 20% of total compute in the market, which is by itself an incredible achievement, right, just considering, like, how much old compute there is. Um, so there are long cycles. These are long, long cycles. Smaller things can happen much more quickly. And when, you know, when I look at that graph, right, is it, is it a roller coaster? Right? You, you're guaranteed to start on one side and you're going to move, or are you just going to get to a particular point and fail? Like there are technologies that we see on various points in that graph that people would consider mature things that organizations have to do as part of their organizational responsibilities. So I'm not so bothered about being in the trough. The real question is, you know, are we moving at a reasonable pace along the track? Like, we've done the hype thing. We've done the years and years of stability-focused work. We now have an established customer base and use case, and we know what we're doing. Are we going to slowly, you know, or hopefully not so slowly, move up the track of enlightenment and, you know, uh, just become part of the thing that everybody uses? Um, and that takes time, right? I'm, I've been doing this a while, so I'm, I'm used to things taking time. I'm, I'm, I'm the gray beard up here, yeah. Oh, Mitch is the actual beard. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I'm fine with it, actually. So I'm gonna ask one last person something, and I'm sorry. Uh, Mitch, speaking of old compute, um, you have a long history of a lot of networking technologies, right? You've been through you know, at, worked at all three of the major cloud providers, um, got a lot of experience working uh, on you know, older hardware, big IP, things like that. What sort of common use cases um, and, and common pro problems do you see you, your users trying to solve? And how has service mesh helped or, or not? Um, does that question make sense? Yeah, I, I think it does. And I think what's interesting is that the use cases have largely not changed over the last 25 years or so. Talk to, uh, talk to us about that. What, what, what sort of use cases are you, are you describing? You look back to 1998, F5 launches, big IP hardware. There were a few other vendors at the time. And over the next maybe six years, they became fairly dominant in the space. And largely, what did it do? Well, it was L7 load balancing, path-based routing, header-based routing. These should start to sound familiar. SSL termination, air gap inspection, egress controls. Mm -hmm. And uh, really, in terms of the use cases, that's very much the same thing that we're trying to accomplish today. Now, hardware was not a terribly scalable way to implement that functionality. Probably right for 1998. Uh, less bright for 2024, certainly. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've found new, scale, new ways to scale those sort of solutions, new ways to make them agile, to bring them close to your application. But the, fundamentally, the problems that we're solving are not especially different from what we thought they were 25 years ago. Absolutely. So now I've got a couple of quotes from, from uh, the report from users who are um, in the middle of using service mesh. And these are their, some of their opinions and conclusions. And John, I want you to um, answer the question that follows after it. So first, uh, first quote, service mesh technology can be useful when deploying microservices in Kubernetes, but it's never required. It's never required. I'm going to let that sit for just a little bit. The idea that, yeah, this is useful for this use case, but ultimately it's not something that's required. The next quote, service mesh technology t t consumes resources and typically adds overhead to the interactions that it manages. Some vendors now support alternate architectures, such as a shared agent model to reduce overhead, uh, but this solution reduces some of the observability benefits that you originally get within service mesh. So John, 
Does this mean that investing, for users of investing in service mesh, does that mean they made a mistake? I definitely don't think so. I mean, like they say it's not necessary, and I would agree with that. Like service mesh is not inventing any new features that weren't done before, but what it does is make them easier, more consistent, more reliable, right? Uh, do I need to run on Kubernetes? No, I could run a VM. Do I need a VM? No, I could run on bare metal, right? But we have all these tools now that help make things easier. Uh, and sometimes those are really necessary. Like we saw the talk earlier today where someone had compliance goals to meet and the timeline to do it without service mesh was like, I think it was 12 years or six years or something like that. And with service mesh, it was, I don't, know, I don't remember, a few weeks or months or something. Um, so it's not so much about whether it's strictly required, it's about what's the easiest, most efficient way to achieve those goals. Anybody else have something you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you shouldn't be using all of the features of service mesh actively all of the time. That's, that you don't need to use it. Um, right? you know, I think people would say you want certain things running in the background all the time, like you want observability to be on, you want logging, right? You probably want things to be secure, right, depending on what your requirements are. Those are just background concerns. But we, like going to a team and telling them you need to use service mesh now, well, what for? No, you use it when you need it, right? Like it's, it's a tool, you pick it up when you want it, you put it back down when you don't. You know, there was obviously the big impedance mismatch. It was like a tool that was really large and constantly plugged in and making a lot of noise, which was what sidecars are, sitting on, like, on your work desk. And that's the problem, right? It was the perceptual problem. We never wanted service mesh to be infrastructure that you consumed. We wanted it to be utility that you used. Um, and so you know, that's the way we'd like to think of it. I don't, I don't want people to, like the majority of people in an organization to be on the daily using service mesh. That's not the right mental model for this, right? It is supposed to be in the background as infrastructure that you, and a tool you pick up when you need it, and that's it. I think there's a strong correlation with what you're talking about and boringness, uh, which you might turn that hype curve upside down. We've been talking forever about we wanted service mesh to get to the point where it was boring. And boring is somewhere between the trough of disillusionment, the disillusionment and the plateau of productivity. That's where we get to boring. Uh, you talk about a user case, I need MTLS everywhere. I run a Helm command, I label a couple of namespaces, I have MTLS everywhere. That's not an exciting user story. Uh, that would be hard to fill a lightning talk with the explanation of what just happened, let alone a 25-minute slot. And yet that's exactly the sort of story that we're aiming for as a project. You have a need, you do something very simple, that need is met, and you can get back to doing your day job. I, I think that's what's great about pulling one feature at a time off the service mesh shelf. So I've got it. I, I love those points because I think it gets to the heart of the fact that people who are coming to cloud native or service mesh, you're not looking to just adopt a technology. You're trying to solve a problem. Um, and so all of you are ICO TOC members, I think, the, at least for three years. Um, <clears throat> I've got a challenge for you. Without using the word ambient, can you, talk, can you give an example of how the TOC has tried to push for that boringness, how you as, have led the, pro the, the project in a way to emphasize boringness? I mean, I could talk about the upgrade and maintenance strategy for yes. the last five years, <laughs> like, which is an extremely boring topic, but right, with all the early pain we had in the project, <laughs> making sure that you could go from release to release, no matter, like, no new features, don't care, you could just go from release to release and the upgrade would work. Uh, and that we fixed the bugs, right? That's just the kind of normal, boring background commitment to making things work, regardless of which particular technology or feature we're trying to ship. And like, that's been a, I've literally been on stage saying, like trying to make Istio boring for five years. <laughs> uh, hopefully we've succeeded a little bit, or maybe this talk is succeeding. Um, but yeah, that's an example. I mean, for folks who might not be as familiar, I know we've got several people who there's their first Istio day, the first KubeCon. Um, Mitch, I know that's something that you've worked on is the upgrade story. Can you, can you talk about some specifics about how Istio seeks to make upgrades boring? I mean, sure, our, our research early on in upgrades around, let's say, the 1.4 to 1.6 time frame was that some of our enterprise customers, our early adopters, were literally taking more time to validate an Istio release and an upgrade than it took us to build it. 
So we're shipping software once every three months and it takes five months to validate a release. Our customers were telling, like, there's no way to keep up with that. Uh, and so that was a, a very strong signal. It was not possible for those users to stay patched against CVEs in production, which is security being one of the core foundational principles within a service mesh. So we spent uh, months to years across uh, dozens of engineers building out tests, identifying flakes, reworking our test framework all together, and building extremely convoluted and complicated dashboards to watch what customers are upgrading from which version to which version, and about how long does it take them from 100% on 1.2 to 100% on 1.3. And we watched over, it took a long time, maybe two years, as all of those metrics moved towards what we would consider an acceptable level there's still always a good number of people who install Istio and just want to forget that it's there and leverage it. We'll never get past that. Uh, but by and large, the customers who we saw are willing to do the work to upgrade their clusters were able to do so. And I think our threshold was that it should take less than a week uh, to upgrade a, uh, any given cluster. And we were able to see that being met by and large. So I want folks to, to participate here. How many of you are involved in patching CVEs in your Kubernetes cluster? Raise your hand. It's a, it's a decent number. It's a decent number. John, talk to them about why upgrading is so important in relation to CVEs and CVE patching. Am I allowed to say ambient now? <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> yes, all right. I, I can't go more than a minute, so I, I would have had to keep it short. Um, so one of the things with the ambient that we've done to help with this is that we've decoupled the data plane from the applications, right? So. The <laughs> We, in the past, I've had this conversation 100 times, like, yeah, to upgrade, it's easy. You just go run the command to upgrade, and then you just go restart all your deployments. And they're like, what? You restart all my deployments? I'm going to need to go talk to 100 teams, and like, they're all going to get pissed off at me, too. Um, so we've, that was like the number one thing that we always wanted to solve back like four years ago when we were first talking about like the very, very, very early beginnings of Ambient. That was exactly the thing we wanted to address, right, is how can we decouple these uh, upgrades from the application so that it's more seamless for them. Um, so that's one of the big innovations there, for sure. Yeah, maybe we could take a quick straw poll. Keith, you asked how many people were involved in maintaining the Kubernetes clusters. How many of you have Kubernetes clusters that you want to upgrade but can't, and you know they have a CVE in them? We won't tell your security team, we promise. <laughs> they are the security team, Keith. <laughs> Yeah, so this, this, this is important, right? Like the, the way that you maintain secure software is by being able to routinely upgrade. And um, again, I think Ambient has been mentioned in literally every single talk. And that's not us trying to inflate the hype. It's because we really feel like we are solving real problems that you and other users are having to deal with every single day. And ultimately, as craftspeople of software, that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, if you allow me to weigh in, uh, the way I, I actually had a debate with one of our Saika users in the community just a few days ago. He come to me and said, look, uh, why, uh, why is Ambient positioned as simplified? Because from his perspective, he thinks Saika is also super, super simple because he adopt, he's a Saika user running Saika in production, right? Um, he's really happy with Saika, and what he's unhappy about me is I'm writing books about Ambient and say how great Ambient is. So to him, the fundamental problem of Istio is uh, it needs to be simplified, and it needs to be disappearing into the infrastructure. And it took us like five years to kind of realize, well, Saika could potentially be simplified and disappear into your infrastructure if you paid for your organization to pay for the approval of you know, having the Saika resources, if you paid the engineering effort to you know, have DevOps pipeline to automate all the Saika, pick up the CVE with every single Envoy Istio releases, you, are, you may be happy with Saika. Think about Saika is disappearing in your infrastructure, but that's only if you paid for that upfront cost. With Ambient, we have a real opportunity to disappear into your infrastructure 
infrastructure. How many of you were in the live demo I show uh, today, right? The reason I was able to show a live demo on this really, really crappy conference Wi-Fi is because Ambien made it so easy. It really disappeared into my infrastructure as my Kubernetes. I was able to, you know, add my pods into Ambien. I was able to show uh, egress gateway to control traffic to open open AI, and uh, you know it worked all seamlessly because it's truly disappearing into the infrastructure. Awesome. <clears throat> so, so far, uh, we've talked about what this trough of disillusionment is. We've realized that maybe it's not so bad for us to be there. We've talked about some of the ways both before Ambient as well as now with Istio Ambient that the project is trying to um, provide more value to users, taking the feedback that we've heard and putting it into practice. So I guess the last question that I have for our TOC panel, is Istio still a good option for innovators? On that far left side of that trough graph, right, is Istio still a good option for people who are wanting to break through, people who are maybe doing AI, running state-of-the-art workloads that are doing things that nobody has done before? Is Istio a good option for them to adopt? Yeah, I can weigh in since I've been learning AI myself, right? I mean, every single company right now I talk to, um, they want to build an AI agent. I mean, right? Because uh, if you can have a customer AI agent that tailors to all the knowledge of your company, why would you ask your coworker before you ask the AI agent first, right? So the power of Istio Ambient, particularly the fact that it's disappearing into the infrastructure where you can focus on your application whether that's generative AI application or not, it's really powerful, right? Because you immediately gained all the benefits that comes with the mesh without any change to your application, which is what I try to learn when I was building generative AI application, whether I was running large language model locally on my laptop or I was using open AI, uh, it all worked seamlessly without needing to change any of my application code, which is really, really, really powerful. So that's one vote for yes. That's one yes. I mean, Istio is networking infrastructure, right? It does some things to raise the level of abstraction if those things matter to people. And I think they continue to matter. Uh, in fact, we've seen more pressure, more market pressure, uh, particularly on some of the security things that Istio has provided, continuing to drive growth in adoption. Right, like we may have this trough of disillusionment per Gartner, but if we look at adoption statistics, like we see more Istio adoption today in bigger enterprises than we ever have, because it does these important things. I think those important things are important for anybody building those types of applications. Right, we help connect applications irrespective of what the underlying network topology is. So if your application runs on a Kubernetes cluster on premise, in the cloud, or on a VM, we make or abstract away some of the networking topology differences so the applications can consume those services without needing to change. Right? That independence from the underlying infrastructure continues to be an important theme in the industry. Kubernetes provides it for compute and scheduling. Istio is there to provide it for service access and security. And I, I just don't see that going away. Right? Maybe we have to get a lot better at it, but uh, I, I think that's just a fundamental thing. Right? I, I don't think the universe wants to live in the world where we'd name services after IPv6 addresses. I just don't think that's what people want. Uh, and I just don't think that's changed. And it helps software development velocity in aggregate. So I, I, th I think that will just continue to happen. Yeah, I think it's, it's really actually the like, more boring technology is actually a pretty good fit for a company that's doing innovation because there's kind of, I've heard this concept of like an innovation budget. Like where do you want to spend your time? Is it on the service mesh or is it on your cool new AI startup or whatever you're, you're working on, right? And a lot of times the people that are on kind of the bleeding edge startups, smaller companies, they're very agile and they're pivoting a lot, right? They're deciding one day we're an AI startup, the next day we're, a, I don't know, a food company. Crypto. One day we're, <laughs> one day we're running serverless, the next we're on cloud, and then we're on-prem, and they need that agility and not having to think about their service mesh, and it's a pretty good fit. So it's kind of like the more boring software is a good fit for the companies that are on the innovative side. Also a good fit for the more boring companies as well, but 
it's not that you know you shouldn't build your innovation stack on the Wasm eBPF blockchain AI <laughs> compute or something, right? That's uh, a distraction. So John has now won our buzzword game. Uh, <laughs> how many buzzwords can you fit into an answer? That's also my next project after Istio. So. <laughs> So after three yeses, I, I can't say yes. I have to be the guy to say no. Uh, I, but your, your question was a little bit ambiguous. You asked if Istio is right for innovators. And I'll say uh, contributing to Istio is not likely to be the right place for a ton of innovation over the next two years. Uh, we feel like we've finally achieved boring. Uh, and if you come with a design doc to our meeting that is going to rethink everything and have a very innovative new way to do service mesh, we will probably invite you to do that in a different repository. Uh, we want, you want, I assume, from what I've heard from all of our users, you want a service mesh that stays boring, that you're able to get back to innovating in the ways, in the things that really matter to you and not have to spend most of your time thinking about your network. Uh, and so we are planning to not be a particularly innovative project in that sense. Not that we won't improve, have new features and bug fixes, but the things that are going to get approved are going to be the obvious right choices, not the uh, innovative, risky new bets. Yes. I, will, yeah. I will say that one of the things we've done with Ambient, though, is to make it more pluggable based on open standards, all these things, so that if there are some crazy idea that you want to integrate into the mesh, that doesn't mean that you have to go put it into the core project, which is good for everyone, because if you're doing something in the core project, it takes time, you need approval, but doing something on your own that can plug into these two, you can rapidly innovate, uh, ship it to the community and get feedback on it. And we've made a lot of more extensibility points uh, to actually accomplish that in Ambient uh, that I'm pretty excited about. So. so usually I don't do this, but we have about five minutes left. And so I'm going to sick you all on our panel um, and open things up for questions. Uh, if you have a question you want to ask the SEO TOC, um, now is your opportunity. And we will run a mic out to you. For the first few people ask question, I have the book to give away. We just sweeten the deal. Don't be shy. You get, an, you get to ask a question and you get a book. What better deal can you ask for? Come on. No, but we got one. I think we're in the trough of blood sugar. Raise your hand again so I can find you. You're stuck in the room until all the books are gone, so. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> thanks. So, I've been working, I've been trying to find like the simple path to go from a sidecar based, Istio API based deployment of Istio to get to ambient and sidecarless and Kubernetes gateway API. And it seems like there's quite a few hurdles to jump through to get there in a a uh, way that minimizes disruptions, like are there going to be more examples and documentation on how to get through that particular route? Yeah, I mean, the, the short answer is John can do it today, uh, which is a way of saying that it's not boring, right? And we, we shouldn't make promises to you about things that we don't think you should be trying. Um, absolutely, yes. It is 100% part of the roadmap to figure out how people will go through migrations. We have a lot of ideas. There's a, a lot of the, the underlying infrastructure to make that work is present, but it's not productized. So I, I wouldn't suggest, okay, if you like jumping off cliffs in a squirrel suit, fine, have at it. Uh, other than that, probably not the best thing to be doing, spending your time out for your, your company today. I, I don't think we can give you an exact timeline right here, right now, but we will definitely be spending this time on this in every upcoming release. Like We are well aware of how important this is. There's a very large install base of people on sidecars. A lot of them have asked about moving. I, I, I get this question several times a day, probably. Um, but I don't have a concrete timeline that I would be willing to hand out just now. But know that it's something we all care about. I will say one thing we've done, as we mentioned earlier, like East Joe took off like all these features, we realized early on that if we tried to have feature parity with every single possible feature of sidecars, we would never ship ambient. And so we intentionally have a pretty large, still, core set of features that we took to GA. And now we finally just launched GA last week. 
Uh, so now it's finally like a time to take a breather, go back, like go address those use cases, get the migrations, uh, you know, continue to iterate on the upgrade story, better documentation, that sort of thing. So I think that will start to accelerate soon as well. There's also a change in user sentiment there because a year ago, we start, when we were talking about migration, the overwhelming response from sidecar users was, don't fix what isn't broken. I, I've paid the price to integrate sidecars. I've automated my upgrades. Please don't make me go through that again and learn something entirely new. And so we deprioritized at that point our work on migration stories. We went ahead and put that off. Uh, I think you're the sixth person I've heard ask today how to migrate compared to zero all week at KubeCon last year. So there's definitely a shift in perception and interest, and that's going to drive our backlog. One more. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, we have some workloads that are like testing out the sidecar version of Istio, but in our environment, uh, Istio's coming soon for us, like we're about to implement it. Uh, would it be better for us to just, for as like a cluster-wide scale, not just for those user groups, just implement it in ambient mode first, and then just kind of work with any sort of users who want to do that migration? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, like John was just mentioned, right? Ambient implements most of the feature of the sidecar, so I would recommend you to uh, look at what features specifically you need in sidecar. Most likely, it's already in ambient. If so, I would definitely recommend you just start with ambient so you don't have that migration pain point, right? Because building up the sidecar, be able to feel comfortable running sidecar and be able to have your DevOps op automation around the sidecar is going to be quite costly. And also around, you know, every single release, restart your application to pick up new version of the sidecar. And then we also talk about all or nothing of sidecar, right? If you just need layer four, Ambient provides zero trust tunnel, and then you can put layer seven selectively based uh, particular namespace you need. So it's a lot more flexibility. I would definitely recommend you check out Ambient first, uh, especially if you are in prototyping, you know, evaluation stage of the sidecar. Anybody have any last things they want to add to that? I don't think we have time. We don't have time for any other questions. Any last comments from the panel before we? Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing you have to look at the specific set of features, um, like, we, we don't claim that Ambient supports everything, so there may be something in your use case. Grab one of the people here, or there's a gazillion Istio experts in this room who've dealt with a bunch of stuff and are up to date. So, you know, find somebody and just, uh, they can help you make that decision very quickly, honestly. All right, that's the time that we have. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, please take a uh, scan this QR code and let us know how you enjoyed this panel. Um, we'd love to, to do these and keep these uh, keep these coming for you. So please do provide that feedback. Uh, please give a round of applause to our uh, panel for this uh, session.